other than that, we would like to officially welcome you uh, to how to launch a successful startup uh, hosted in collaboration vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Columbia Alumni Association. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for uh, helping us host the event today, as well as uh, Flick, uh, Michelle Kwok, who is going to be uh, actually moderating the panel today and talk to you a little bit more about her venture, uh, and the CWBSA, which is Columbia Women's Business Society alumna organization, which for those of you who might not be familiar with our organization, we are what is called a shared interest group at Columbia, open to all schools, all alumna of all schools, uh, at Columbia. So if you haven't heard of us and would like to learn more about us, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to join vis-a-vis uh, -vis our newsletter, which one of our board members will be able to put in the chat momentarily. We work very closely uh, with the CAA to help put on programming like the program that you're going to be participating in today to help uh, bring a variety of networking opportunities, upskilling opportunities, and informational uh, events uh, to uh, alumni throughout uh, throughout all of the schools at Columbia. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle to introduce herself and actually uh, introduce all of the speakers as well. We are excited for an interactive session today and thank you again so much for joining. Amazing. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. I'm Michelle, I am the co-founder and CEO of Flick and I'm super excited to be moderating this panel today. It's been a month or so in the making. Um, so Flick is a platform and community hub that connects female founders and leaders with learners from all across the world through meaningful apprenticeships. So as we all know, female founders are notoriously under-resourced so they're able to get helping hands in their businesses and students or learners are able to gain career relevant experience, skills training and mentorship under established female leaders. We now have a community of over 11,000 women from 57 countries around the world. And we're always looking to accelerate women-led ventures and connect with other organizations that are mission aligned to see how we can continue supporting female founders and future female founders. Um, so that's a little bit about me. If you wanna check out our website, check it out at weareflick.com. It's weareflik.com. Otherwise, I will jump into the panelists because that's why we're all here today. Um, so let's just jump into really quick intros. It's easier if the panelists themselves intro themselves as they are the ex experts on themselves. <laughs> so Andrea, would you like to go ahead first on your quick intro? Sure, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, my name is Andrea Afua Kwamia, and I am the founder of BGOM Consulting, and that stands for Black Girl on Mars Consulting. So what I do is I offer um, brand and marketing consulting, diversity consulting, and I coach individuals who struggle with anxiety or per per perfectionist tendencies in terms of understanding and executing their personal goals. Um, I started out BGOM consulting um, really as a small idea where I was um, having diversity talks with fe Black female professionals on my podcast. Um, and that has branched out into um, what it is today. And um, previously, I worked as a brand marketing specialist, so a behavioral analyst. So um, that's about it for me. Someone just said, OMG, how do I contact you struggling professionally? <laughs> well, <Bye -bye. laughs> I'll definitely be talking a little bit more about that later because it's um, actually our anniversary and we've helped um, three companies and four individual coaching um, clients. So I just love to help individuals. So um, I'm sure we'll get into that later when Michelle asks us some questions. <laughs> I would definitely love to dive into that. I, I, I always, as well, struggle with that. Um, amazing. Uh, Camille, would you like to go ahead? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and able to share um, mouth off um, with you all. So I'm the founder of mouth off, which is the first and only product able to get rid of bad breath in under 60 seconds. Um, unlike all the other products on the market today that are only able to temporarily hide it. Um, so we're really excited to be bringing the millions of people affected a solution that actually works. Um, and the formula is also plant-based, sugar-free, no artificial sweeteners, flavors, colors, um, no plastics. We launched direct to consumer uh, a couple of months ago and um, are very excited for the early momentum uh, and growth that we've been seeing. Uh, I'm a Barnard alumna and a Columbia Business School alumna as well. Amazing, congratulations on the launch. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, someone else also recently had a launch. So Cindy, would you like to would you like to go ahead with your intro? Yeah. Hi everyone. My name is Cindy. Thank you for all being here today. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Toscana USA. It's a family business. My father and I launched our business eight years ago from the basement of our home, selling uh, handcrafted men's shoes and accessories from Florence, Italy. And just a few months ago in January, we launched our e-commerce division. Uh, we're known for three specific characteristics. We are known for our unique hand-painted technique. We are known for a patent dip dye process that is unique to our brand and takes four days uh, to produce a shoe that's very flexible. There's no break-in uh, period required. And we're known for our ability to produce larger sizes, that size is 15 up to 22. We've had the opportunity to custom make shoes for Shaquille O'Neal. And so we really focused on developing the larger size segment on our e-commerce platform. Thank you. That is so cool. That, Thank those you. shoes must have been really big. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. And last but not least, Jenna, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Michelle. And hi, everyone. My name is Jenna. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Millie. So Millie is a social ed tech social enterprise uh, revolutionizing high school education by bringing the world class career and academic mentors um, directly to the school. I am a alum of uh, Columbia Business School EMBA. And a uh, fun fact about me actually is um, when I was in college, I didn't think that I was going to be able to graduate because I couldn't pay for my tuition. So I um, took two years of leave of absence from school. I built my own tutoring business and um, I made more than $200,000 and graduated um, with that money. Um, but instead of being you know, incredibly proud of what I have done, I was actually somewhat embarrassed and I felt like I was behind other people because I went to Cornell for undergrad and was like everyone was doing these shiny internships at the bank and consulting, et cetera. And I was just tutoring kids. So I worked that much harder to catch up um, on other people. And then prior to building Millie, um, fast forward to 2019, I was a vice president of AI research at JP Morgan. And um, when I told my parents, I'm gonna quit my job to build another tutoring company, they thought that I'd gone out of my mind. But since then, uh, we actually won the third place at Columbia Startup Challenge this year. And um, slowly but surely we're getting a lot of traction We've worked with more than 3,000 students from 20 different countries. So yeah, I'm here to share my journey and excited to be here. I can definitely resonate with that. I was I, I was previously a medical science student. I was meant to be going to med school. And um, the summer that I was gonna take my MCAT, I told my parents I was going to leave and be an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, so- They're like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're like, they, they were like, oh, we're gonna have an intervention. And they had like several <laughs> interventions, didn't work though. And now they talk about me in their WhatsApp groups. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so I, I love hearing about all your stories. I think a, a common thread through uh, many of your careers is that you started off in a corporate or a larger company environment. I'd love to, for each of you to dive more into how you made that decision to leave your job to pursue a startup and why you thought it was the right time. Jenna, you talked a little bit about that. So let's start with you. Yeah, definitely. So I guess, um, yeah, um, I guess, you know, I don't know, many of us may have experienced that, but um, after about 10 years of a this shiny career, I was certainly doing everything that I thought I wanted. I was definitely doing everything that everyone else thought was cool to do. I lived in New York, I lived in London, I lived in Singapore and worked at a bank, did data science, but ultimately it came to the point that, you know, it wasn't really fulfilling. Um, I didn't know what that was. Um, so I, I kind of like, sort of like walked around like a zombie for the past, last two years of my, I guess, like career. Um, and then ultimately came to the conclusion that, you know, I wanted to do something more purposeful and what I, um, makes me happy. And to me, that was education. And to me, that's, um, mentoring other people and, you know, helping them to be the best version of themselves as cliche as it sounds. And um, I come from very international background. So we work with international school students around the world. So yeah, that's my journey getting there. Very cool, very cool. Camille, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, so uh, I come from CPG um, and brand management, which definitely has helped uh, significantly in launching a CPG brand. Um, I was at Dannon and then I was at L'Oreal and I actually had um, a previous business. First of all, I want to say, you know, as you can see from the diversity of the, of, of the paths, you know, that each of these founders, you know, have, have taken to get to their business, there's 
a lot of different ways of, of making choices and of getting there. But for me, um, I personally don't know if I would have launched into entrepreneurship in this specific category, not having had um, very solid, um, you know, uh, larger company experience prior, um, you know, to going at it my own way. I think, um, you know, when you're launching um, an ingestible product specifically, uh, there's just, I mean, a lot of moving pieces, um, a lot of regulatory components. And uh, I felt very lucky that I was able to learn from absolutely beautiful companies before going at it on my own. Um, and the story of how I actually decided to take the leap, you know, which is uh, very challenging. I mean, there are uh, a lot of, um, you know, financial considerations uh, to take uh, into consideration, lifestyle considerations. I think sometimes we, we forget to talk about those and just talk about how exciting the journey is. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a, like everything very complicated and has multiple sides to it. Um, but I actually was... Um, doing a consulting project and met my ingredient supplier. Um, and through that engagement, I learned of this big uh, and widespread problem that is bad breath. And I was completely horrified when I found out that people were spending billions of dollars on all these products that weren't actually uh, delivering on their promise. And my ingredient supplier had an ingredient um, that had all the research um, behind it that actually had the efficacy. Um, and promised um, to deliver on, on, on what you would expect. And so uh, based on all the consumer products experience that I had, I ended up pitching them an idea of um, partnering and commercializing this ingredient that hadn't yet been brought to market in a product and in a brand that I would create. I think the fact that I had a lot of prior CPG experience uh, also gave them the confidence of wanting to partner with me. Um, they're a huge multi-billion dollar biotech. Um, you know, and, and, and the partnership comes, you know, with exclusivity and, 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 and all these kind of, you know, great, um, support elements. Um, and, uh, I felt like if I wasn't going to do it, um, you know, this problem might not get solved anytime soon. And so I just went for it. Um, you know, knowing, uh, since I'd had a previous business as well, the challenges and the risks and the difficulties of, uh, launching a consumer product, um, but also, having um, you know, a lot of big corporate experience uh, you know, to lean on, um, which I think was, was, was quite helpful. I like how you kind of talked a little bit about how it is really, really difficult. I think a, a lot of entrepreneurship sometimes it's glamorized, especially you know, on LinkedIn and social media. I don't know if, if you see on TikTok, people will always be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Uh, you should quit your job right now. But let's, we'll dive a little bit more into that after everyone else is able to share their stories because that first year is always a tough one. Yeah, That's and a Michelle, I also just wanted to really quickly add, I think a lot of people, yeah. because this is like one of the big things that, um, <laughs> that I focus on too, um, is the fact that um, choosing startup or entrepreneurship as a life you know, is um, a business choice, um, you know, that one should make. And I truly believe that um, you need to try to, you know, do your due diligence, just like you would in taking a job, um, as to whether that opportunity that you have or you're embarking on, um, you know, is the right one. Um, and that goes uh, by asking all the questions for me, you know, it specifically incorporated trying to validate and test and prove out as much of the business as I could prior to raising money or, you know, um, going at it full time, um, you know, and, and um, giving up, you know, additional income. And so I think that, you know, to, to what you were saying, I think these are, are, are really important things, you know, that's, that, that entrepreneurs or, or you know, um, potential entrepreneurs should be uh, thinking through. And a lot of times people are just, you know, encouraged to just jump in. Um, I personally, think that's for me was not the way, you know, I thought that I really needed to, to actually, you know, gut check, not just the idea, but you know, the requirements right. that we're going to need it, be needed, et cetera. So anyway, sorry if I took another second uh, to. No, it's okay. I think <laughs> those two cents. I think we will definitely dive a little bit more into this to understand how to do that due diligence, because there's definitely a lot of things I think a lot of people don't think about. Um, it's hard to learn about entrepreneurship because there's so many different types of entrepreneurship. It's not like, oh, let's look at Deloitte Consulting. What is this job? What are the hours? It can vary. So we'll definitely dive into that. Um, Cindy, do you want to go ahead and share your story? Sure. Yeah. So my father was a really major influence in my life, especially getting into the shoe business. 
Uh, my father's been in the shoe business for over 30 years, and my journey started when I was really young. Um, at nine years old, um, no one would be able to tell. Um, he noticed that I was very shy, quiet. I didn't want to speak. And he said, no, we have to, you know, show you how to use your voice to speak to people. And at the time, he was a traveling salesman selling shoes. Uh, so he said, Cindy, you can become my co-pilot and come. So we literally traveled, you know, across the United States. I was a little girl. He would put me in a room full of retailers and he's like, talk to them. So I would be nine years old talking to retailers that are, you know, in their 30s and their 40s. And I was a little intimidated. And, uh, and my journey started there. Um, I literally learned the shoe business just by observing my father speak, interact with retailers, attending trade shows with him. Um, granted, I never sold product because I was not an employee. <laughs> I was just his co-pilot. So I really watched and learn. And I didn't know that that was my career path. So when I went to, I attended community college, I did a lot of banking internships. I said, I don't want to do this. I don't like the lifestyle. Um, I interned at Rebecca Minkoff and there was a, an interest in fashion. I worked in customer service. Um, and then that initially prompted me to switch to attend FIT. Um, so at FIT, my father concurrently, he was working at a shoe business and he quit his job. And so um, I told my father, um, I've learned the shoe business by traveling with you. I've learned to uh, love the fashion industry. And so he said, why don't we start our company? So it was a very serious discussion because we invested our life savings into the business. And we said, we have to make this work. We have to survive because this is, you know, all our money is in the inventory. And so um, we launched that and I was at FIT. Um, since I knew that I wanted to really work in my family business, this was in 2014. Um, I said, I want to learn how to manage inventory since that's fashion's most important asset. It's how do you manage the inventory that where all your money is sitting. So I worked at Ross stores for two years and in 2018, I literally said, you know what, I've learned the skill set, and I think it's time for me to come back to my family business and actually expand and grow it because that's always been my passion. And so I went to Columbia to get my MBA to further equip me with the skills necessary to assume the role as a CEO of the company. And so um, that's essentially what happened. So I graduated from Columbia and we just launched our e-commerce division um, of our footwear company. So it's a really exciting time for us. And, you know, we're expanding and growing and we have this model where we grow slow and steady because you can be very nimble and control things. And I think we'll dive into how we've been able to survive um, COVID because of how conservative, conservative we've been throughout the years we've been in business. Amazing. Yeah, I'd love to dive into that a little bit more. It's really cool to see how you all built your professional experiences kind of in order to become the entrepreneur that you wanted to be. Um, so thank you for, for sharing your story. Andrea, I, I think your story is very interesting. Um, in your bio, I think you mentioned that you realized that you were being paid 23% below the baseline when you were working at a larger company. I would love for you to talk about that transition from working at a large share company, becoming an entrepreneur. And maybe if you can also talk about, were you a perfectionist? Is that why you got into this kind of business? I yeah. know are, are, are wanting to hear about that. So yeah, go I ahead. Absolutely. So, um, well, I will say um, just as a baseline that I'm really greedy for knowledge. And I think that's sort of what ended me, landed me into this um, space of being a researcher, but similar to you, prior to even getting into a corporate, I always thought that I was going to be in the medical world. Like I'm, I'm East and West African, like it, and I was putting the pressure on myself, but I always thought that I was going to be helping people. That's always been my main value um, driver and at, at the core. But um, when I went to um, SPS for um, strategic communications, when I graduated, I ended up getting all of these offers from huge companies. And I'm sure many of you can, um, you know, com can relate to this when you have sort of this shiny offer and, um, and you're like, and you have everyone telling you, oh my God, it's this company, you have to go there. And this happened to be multiple times when, and I didn't even realize that I was moving farther and farther away from the motto of, I really want to help people. And I always thought that, you know, as long as I'm doing my job, I am helping my team. I'm, I'm doing the best work that I can, but it, I always felt a little bit disconnected from, you know, the North star of these companies because it wasn't about the individual. Um, so when I first left 
Columbia, I, I was offered a role at a big um, tech company, tech and entertainment company. And um, it was my first time consulting. And during the time we were, there was an IPO that was um, set to um, go into place soon. And they said, after the IPO, you're gonna be full-time. And I was like, okay, great. Well, when that time comes, I'm ready to negotiate. I went in and they gave me a really a miserable offer. <laughs> and um, I decided, I was like, give me a week. I'm gonna go and ask any, well, I didn't tell them I was doing this, but I went to ask anyone who was willing to tell me what they were making. And as an analyst, I put the numbers together pretty quickly and I was making 23% the baseline of the average analyst, the only one with my master's and the um, marketing associates were making a little bit more than me. Um, so that was in 2017. And that's the time when I came up with the, the idea for um, starting a company, Black Girl on Mars. But as uh, you know, as Camille was sort of inferring, like we all have to pay our bills. So I ended up staying um, in corporate for several years following that. And honestly, I think when COVID hit and you know a lot of people were making cutbacks, uh, I felt like this was the time when I would have less pressure um, for everything to be perfect because everyone was in a scramble to figure everything out. Um, and I never wanted to launch Black Girl on Mars because it's a bit of a, um, the name in, implies a lot of things and I didn't really want to implicate any of the brands I was working with at the time. Um, and so I decided to step away so that I could follow this, um, this goal. Um, and so to answer your question, am I a perfectionist? I am and I didn't know it. And I don't know how many of you uh, have ever been in this situation where like you're working on a project late night, you it's probably done, it's probably good enough, but you're like, oh, I just have to make these tweaks. I can add a little bit more research here. Um, and you just needle it. And I, I, I noticed that a lot of my clients have these similar tendencies where to anybody else coming in, their work is incredible, but they can't let it go. It's their child. And, um, and I think that there are moments where that's okay, but there are moments where we are we're too close to what we're doing and we're not zooming out to see um, the big picture. So, um, and so essentially I, my switch from corporate, it's, it's peripheral. Like I, I'm still working very closely with, with corporate, but the main thing for me um, is the autonomy. Like I, like I said, I'm, I'm greedy for knowledge and I want to be able to know all the working pieces. And that's the thing that I love about being an, an entrepreneur. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I, I want to dive a little bit more into that story. When, when you figured out that your your salary was lower than others, what, what was your mindset? What did you think? And how did you approach it? Sure, that's a great question. At the time, I, I would say that I had a lot of trust for people. I was straight out of grad school. I assumed that, you know, intentions would always be good. And, and I don't think I was thinking of it from a business perspective, right? They're going through an IPO, they're trying to save money. But for me as an individual who's doing the work, I was traveling for them, I was um, leading trainings. I just wanted fair compensation. So. I did everything that I could to try and um, negotiate, see if I could switch teams. And when it wasn't going to work out, I had to make the difficult decision to move on to another company. But it really did teach me something um, because the main thing, I was less angry for myself than who's gonna come in after me? Is there gonna be another black woman that fills this role um, or maybe comes into this company and isn't going to be compensated fairly. And maybe they aren't going to go on a, a, a manhunt to see what everyone else is making. And are they going to know that they're not being compensated fairly? So for me, it's about setting a pathway so that the, the individuals who are following can ensure that, you know, especially being the only black woman on a team, which for mm -hmm. almost all of the companies I've worked for that has been the case, it is something that is always at the forefront of your mind. What is the precedent right. that's going to be set when you leave? Yeah. So just a last follow up on that. Um, I know that you do a lot in DNI practices. So 
what is the importance of implementing DNI straight from the beginning? I think a lot of startups kind of don't think about it because they're like, there's so many other things to think about. Right. So is it, is that like an important thing? How can startups start to, to build DNI practices from the, from the very, very start? So that's things like this don't happen that when, when you do reach that IPO stage. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I recently just finalized my certification in DENI for the workplace. Um, and there are three um, places that I really do focus on and that are really close to me. Um, the first place, like I said, is um, it, it, this might not seem like it's part of diversity, but it is, but it's the culture, the work-life balance. So um, the way that I describe this is that I do everything with a diversity lens. I think that when we describe um, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, we think of it as other, we think of it as something that we have to um, perform in addition to our jobs. And instead, we really need to learn how to apply this lens. And usually for me, and I'm, mine might be different, the lens really has to do with understanding individuals' behaviors. We might be from different states, different countries, but we might have more similarities than others, maybe because of shared behaviors. And for example, I am an ambivert introvert. So when I was working in corporate offices, I needed quiet spaces. So I was always that person that needed to <laughs> go sit by accounting to do my work because I couldn't sit in the louder spaces. And that has nothing to do with the color of my skin, but it's it, it goes to a need that maybe a group or a segment of people will have. Um, yeah. The second thing that I really do care about are invisible disabilities. This one is so tricky because most of the time people have a fear of disclosing because there's retaliation majority of the time. Um, and also a lot of times people might not know that they even are maybe some of their challenges are related to. So that's a that's a personal problem, but it still affects work. Um, and that is something that we need to understand. Again, if we look at behaviors, if we notice people are struggling with certain things based on behaviors, how can we accommodate for that and without getting into the personal stuff? And the last thing is um, that I'm extremely passionate about, and it goes back to this idea of our people being um, treated fairly and compensated fairly is diversifying leadership pipelines. Um, and that is the idea that majority of the time um, women of color are not being uh, trained or, or you know, groomed to go into executive leadership roles. And a lot of times C next CEOs, CFOs, they're slotted two years in advance. So if we already know who's going to be in and, and it's a small club and individuals are really only getting to maybe manager cap or not even, or if they're not being treated fairly and they leave, then they're just seen as a revolving door. So we need to have these conversations of how are we nurturing people so that when they get into these spaces, they can have the opportunity to climb. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I love how deep you dove into that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to shift gears a little bit because we are talking about building startups and a big part of that is fundraising um, or finding money <laughs> all the time. Founders are always looking for how am I going to fund this? How am I going to fund this? So let's start with Cindy. Uh, uh, it's amazing. You know, you were able to bootstrap your company, I believe, especially a fashion company. You need to pay for raw materials, manufacturing, distribution, all of that stuff. And I know you were talking about we, we're building slowly because then you have control over everything. I loved how you said that. We also bootstrapped like ourselves. So I, I totally know where that mindset is coming from. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you were successfully able to bootstrap to where you are today, how COVID affected everything. I know that you wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, and it is a crowded market, right? Fashion, how are you able to find your niche or your success and get Shaq to wear your shoes? <laughs> That's funny. I know everyone always has that question. How did you get Shaq? Well, I'll get there, I promise. Um, when my father and I, we launched our business, we were like, you know what? We're going to you know, invest our life savings and you know, with our life savings, we had to be very careful how we sent it. So we said, we're not going to pay rent. You know, we're not going to have a, a showroom like a typical fashion company. A typical fas uh, fashion company will have their own showroom where they'll greet their clients. And we said, you know what, we'll scrap that and we're just going to do it from home. 
we decided to invest that money instead into um, attending trade shows. And so that really helped. Uh, that was the main vehicle of our growth for the past eight years. You know, I told my dad, if we're gonna if we're gonna spend X amount of dollars, let's invest it here. And because we went to the trade shows, we've actually been able to cultivate uh, relationships with retailers across the United States and Canada. So the first year um, did not go so well. We, you know, found a factory in Italy and we said, we, d we didn't have any feedback from customers because we didn't know, you know, who, who's going to be wearing our product. And, but we did have the skill set enough to design and to build a brand. And so um, we said, we're going to, you know, we're going to order 500 pairs of shoes and we're going to sell it at the trade show. Uh, mind you, you know, they teach you in business school, I have a target market. And so that came much later. Our first year, we didn't sell anything really because, you know, the customers that approached us, they didn't like what they saw. And I said, oh, oh this is not good. Um, this is our life savings. And so we pushed and pushed. We lowered prices in order to enter the market. And so we found the key is lowering the price to penetrate a crowded market. So, you know, we, we penetrated the market, but we started traveling across the United States. We visited retailers. And we actually got feedback. We spent time in the store. Instead of spending an hour, we would spend four or five hours talking to their customers who wear our shoes. Granted, um, this was very tiring because, you know, imagine four or five hours talking to people, getting customer feedback, really understanding what it is that they're looking for, what they want to wear. And so the second year, we actually took that feedback and we designed an entirely new collection, which sold really well. And people were, you know, really asking for the product. They love the quality. They love the fit and they love that it was not as expensive. One of our value propositions is um, when people assume made in Italy, they assume premium, they assume luxury. And that's not what we're about. Um, a pair of our leather dress shoes retails for $3.95 where a typical uh, similar dress shoe will retail for $1,000 at a high-end name brand. Um, and so we really take the time to really invest in the quality of the product. We use the best, we use Vibram, which is one of the best a souls in the industry. So we really take that into account to offer, you know, really good quality product at an affordable price. And really that's what led us to be successful um, in this space because we did see a niche. We did see that there's an opportunity to enter and penetrate this price point in, in fashion and specifically in footwear. Um, and so that really led us to survive COVID. Um, a lot of the high-end retailers actually, uh, they suffered because there are such high price points. And during a pandemic and during a crisis, people do not prioritize fashion. And so when COVID hit, um, I was really anxious for the, for the months of March, April, and May because retailers are shutting their stores across the United States. And I said, is this the end for us? Um, because, you know, wh wh what could I think? And I, I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning. And I told my dad, we made it this far. And he's like, do not think negative, just, you know, stay positive. And it's really hard to stay positive when all of this is happening. And one day, it was a random Friday, I remember, we received an order for eight pairs, size 51, for a football player. And we were jumping and screaming. We said, oh my God, this is such a, you know, big order. This was actually for a football player that had his wedding in some private space I don't know where he got the permission to do it, but you know, I was happy that he brought our brand. And so we started noticing during COVID that the larger sizes was really picking up. We noticed you know, a month later, people that were size 18, 17, 16, 15, they were just buying shoes. And I said, well, you know, where are they getting this uh, you know, money from? Since a lot of people are losing jobs and you know, I dug in deeper and it was the athletes. The athletes had disposable cash on hand and they were just buying shoes. And we were really thankful that they were buying our brand. And I did a little bit more research and you know, the large size segment really presented a huge opportunity for us in COVID because people were sitting at home and you know, sizes 15, 16, 17, 18 are really hard to find. There's really no diversification of styles for this type of customer. And so um, when they find a brand like us, they just start buying automatically because we offer dress shoes, we offer sneakers, we offer large size belts. We just specialize in this. And this is what really was a learning lesson for us during COVID was, you know, despite all what happened, this is a really good opportunity for us. And I was also reflecting and I was really looking at our business model, how we were conservative. Being conservative during COVID really helped us because we didn't have to pay rent. We didn't have overhead expenses. Our warehouse is in our basement. <laughs> 
Um, granted, we did expand because th since we launched our e-commerce business, we had to go and find a warehouse. Um, but because we strapped our cash, we invested all the profits. Uh, we've been able to expand in a way that allowed us to stay nimble. And I think for us during COVID, being nimble was really an important aspect because if we weren't nimble, if we weren't taking control of, you know, the way that we manage our expenses, our bills, then, you know, th we would see a different outcome. And so we really, you know, we were really happy that COVID actually, um, there was a learning opportunity there. And we learned that our price point, 395 was just perfect enough for people to continue to buy the brand. And uh, we've actually come up stronger than ever before um, during this time. So we were really thankful that, you know, customers still choose our brand. And even today, we're receiving orders from people for weddings and for anniversaries, for events, and they're waiting six months for the shoes, which shows us that there is, um, that they really like our product. And in fashion, it's really important to find a niche um, and really to stay true to your product. Um, we stand behind our product. We deliver excellent customer service. So on the weekends, my father and I we would drive to visit retailers. If someone needed a shoe because of an emergency, we would be there on a Saturday night or Saturday, you know, Sunday morning to deliver that shoe. And so we've been able to develop strong uh, retail relationships because we've been so reliable. And people are like, wow, that's really amazing because we, you, you can be relied on if, if a customer has an emergency. And so that's our forefront of our philosophy is, you know, having a customer centric mindset, putting the customer first above everything else. And that's what enabled us to be very successful. And that continues to be the, the leading success of our e-commerce. Um, and there was a learning curve there because I said, well, now that everything's online, how do you speak to customers? And honestly, I've been reaching out to them via email, calling them, you send them photos, you interact with them in a way that makes it personalized and special. And that really is what drives uh, the conversion and loyalty in, in, in our industry. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I, I think it was, it was great to hear how much you learned from the experience and how you doubled down when you found that there was opportunity as an entrepreneur, even if you're building a business, you might be building yeah. it a certain way. And then there's always going to be something that, that happens and you're going to have to learn to adapt. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Camille, I think you actually fundraised a little bit is that correct from angels um, I so I, I i would love to hear a little bit more um your journey how you were able to raise the angel money and why you decided to go with angel versus vc yeah no absolutely um so uh the product um and the and the brand and the company that you know we've built uh required r d um from the get-go we were creating a completely new type of format which is dissolving gum. It dissolves in your mouth as you chew in under 60 seconds. It was using a completely new ingredient that had never been used in a product before or commercialized um, and scaled up. So I actually needed money. Um, I didn't have any money personally that I could, or enough that I would be able to really put in. Um, so I uh, started out, uh, you know, I raised a pre-seed round. Um, you know, it, it took months and months. I was in an accelerator program last year called ERA. Um, which definitely helped um, a lot. Uh, it was definitely challenging raising during COVID, um, specifically given that we were an ingestible product and weren't in market. Um, uh, I think that that was one of the big uh, decision factors between uh, going the angel route versus the VC route. Um, it's uh, very, very challenging uh, you know, to raise from VC when you're pre-launched. Um, and not only were we, you know, months away from being in market, but at some point last year, we also just ran out of samples, um, because of COVID and our R and D lab, you know, was shut down. <laughs> uh, there were just, yeah, a lot of, 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 you know, just real limitations, you know, that, that make you go one way versus another. But I think that in the end, um, you know, raising the, uh, the angel uh, round, uh, you know, serves us well because what I realized that was that we didn't need as much money as we thought we did um, and that we would be able to hit very important milestones that would set us up for our next round um, with less money um, in the bank. And that means, again, you know, giving up um, less equity uh, so, so for us, I mean, it, it, it all worked out, um, you know, the next round will likely have, you know, a VC component to it, um, just because we're going to be doing a larger one and we're going to need to scale, um, working in, uh, you know, the type of, 
uh, category, um, you know, in business model that I work in, um, you know, you just, uh, you know, need cash, um, not just working capital for inventory, but also, um, you know, marketing acquisition dollars. Um, and uh, sometimes the cash flow situation of when you need to build inventory versus when you're seeing the payout on it, um, you know, are just misaligned. And so you just need to be able to, to weather that. And as you continue to scale, you know, you usually just need more cash um, to finance different channels. I mean, we started specifically direct to consumer because I raised enough money to prove out the um, business idea, uh, you know, in that channel. Um, we're not on Amazon and we're not in retail right now. Um, my next round will be so that we can scale in those channels, but, you know, each channel requires a separate, you know, its own budget. Um, and I think that, you know, these are some of the, the, the considerations and challenges, you know, and, 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 and the diligence um, and, um, you know, the strictness that, you know, I, I personally have approached my business in because, um, I didn't want to spread myself too thin. I wanted to make sure that, you know, the channel we picked, um, we had enough funds to be successful in it and to prove success, you know, so we could move on to the next step. Um, I think just very, very quickly, I'll just mention that COVID um, has, you know, been very challenging in a lot of different ways. Um, for us, you know, we, as we were raising money, got a lot of um, pushback in terms of telling us that our business would no longer be relevant because people were at home not socializing. And so who cares about bad breath? Um, you know, and, and, and the truth of the matter is um, since people were wearing masks, uh, people were actually much more aware of the quality of their own breath and their own bad breath than they might've been pre-COVID. And so this ended up being an opportunity for us, not just um, to respond to investors. I mean, we went and did some market research. We saw that a third of people were actually more concerned about the quality and more aware of their, you know, the quality of their breath than they were um, before wearing masks. Um, and you know, this was also as we were getting ready for launch, um, an angle, um, you know, and, and and a value proposition that uh, you know we really um, got behind um, because we felt that we were going to be even more relevant to our consumers because of um, you know the problem that we were going to be able to solve for them, even if it was just you know them smelling their own breath versus others smelling it. Finally, I'll just say that uh, COVID has, um, you know, created uh, huge labor shortage issues um, in the supply chain. And so for us, um, you know, we've seen significant delays um, in terms of just getting product to market. Last year saw um, immense delays. Uh, and so this was, you know, just one of the realities of the business, um, you know, but same, same as Cindy and similar to it, we had very low overhead that way. And so we're able to really conserve cash and weather out some of those difficult months that had significant insecurity um, and really got us um, even more ready. You know, we were able to do a lot more research, um, you know, and, and testing uh, to make sure that when we launched, um, you know, we had uh, gotten, you know, as, as good as we could um, to ensure success. Yeah, it's interesting to hear how COVID affected you all very differently. I think, Jenna, it's interesting to hear from you because you work in ed tech and I know that has been a huge conversation, how there's been a dramatic shift in the industry with everyone going online. So how did that shift really affect your company, your industry, and where do you see ed tech moving forward in the future? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I guess like one thing I want to note is, um, so we do work with international schools around the world which means that we work with like British School of Hanoi, American School of um, Qatar, you know, Canadian School of Hong Kong. These are our target audience. And we started before um, COVID. So we've been fully virtual way before COVID. Um, so what that means is um, we had a virtual team. We have about, I mean, internal team, like freelance and um, interns all combined, maybe 40 plus. And we have mentors that's more than, mentor meaning like tutors and, um, some of the pro bono mentors, we have more than 300 mentors on our network. And it's always been virtual for us, like everything has been virtual. However, um, before COVID, although we are a virtual ed tech company, we were, we were traveling. So we were depending on in-person interactions for sales and biz dev. And uh, we believe that, you know, we believe that this Chinese wall between the private education and formal education should change. So we always went to schools. We met with counselors and we wanted the counselors to endorse both our free program as well as the paid program. And um, so initially 
this part of it now has to be gone, right? Like we were traveling to Qatar, Saudi Arabia, like UAE, and like we can't do this anymore. So we got to come up with a way that we can do a biz dev. We can actually really speak to the parents, speak to the counselors, speak to the students in the same manner as we could do in person, which is like initially very difficult, right? And also there are some parts that was really, really fun that kind of like got lost along the way. So I guess like one, one funny story that I can share is, um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with international schools, but a lot of international schools in kind of like uh, diplomatic areas or they're like embassy schools, whatnot. So they have very, very strong like security to get in, right? Some of them, you even need to like show your ID and passport. It's not like a public school. You can just like walk in, right? So we were traveling to like Qatar and these places. And then sometimes we had, I mean, now we're getting a lot of inbounds. We're working with more than 300 schools, but initially like no one wanted us to come, right? So, but we were traveling there and then we we're like, we're already here and we don't have any like a meeting or anything, but we gotta go, Vista. We gotta go meet people, right? So let's say there's a, we go to one school and then we talk to the counselor and then ask them for a recommendation for another counselor for another school, right? And then all we have is that person's name. Right. And then we would go to another school where there's this literally like a security guards in front of uh, the school. We would go, but we're so, you know, we're dressed up nicely. So we would go and like say the counselor's name. And then they would be like, just assume that we have a meeting. So we would go into the counseling um, department. We would say someone else's name. And then we would just say like, oh, so-and-so emailed, blah, blah, blah. So sort of like really like a traveling salesman just going into schools, try to make th things happen. So although it was, um, you know, uh, it was, pretty it's a, I'm not a you know like a born salesperson so it, it, it was hard for me but um some of those like fun memories I also have but anyways back to the story that we had to get rid of all of these uh, in-person um kind of aspect of the sales and um you know uh biz dev side of the things but you know it's so we are really almost 100 percent end-to-end um virtual from the sales cycle all the way to teaching, which has always been in the uh, virtual side of the things. And then, you know, it's proven to be very, very efficient. Like uh, Cindy mentioned that we never had a venue. We never had a marketing cost. We never had a ad cost because we go to schools. We are not a B2C um, type of company. And then, so what ended up happening is my co-founder who's based in Hong Kong actually, um, before when it's a Hong Kong students or Hong Kong schools, we thought that it has to be in person, right? And then as you know, whenever it's in person, you know, there's a lot of cost and time uh, that, that you're wasting on the road. And then, so we got to the point of now, you know, even if you're in the same country, even if you're same in city, you can like do everything virtually. And it's very, very efficient for the company's perspective. And like to add on to that at the end, I guess like that's how my company is shifting. And um, in terms of how the ed tech and the education, um, I guess like, ecosystem is um, changing. I want to highlight like two points. So I guess number one thing I would like to highlight is um, the hybrid education is fortunately or unfortunately here to they're here to stay. Um, I believe in in-person education for um, schools, but at the same time, this trend of being able to, you know, get tutored, get uh, learn things, um, you know, um, virtually, it's not going away. And I think that now the online education is not necessarily viewed as less than our uh, in-person education, which is great, right? You know, you can see this not just in education, but other parts as well. For instance, the talk space or, um, you know, better health. So when it comes to like um, counseling or therapy, right? So you can be anywhere in the world and now you get the same um, therapy and then continue on with the therapist. So I think the biggest trend is, um, I see that the hybrid education is here to stay. And then I guess like second to that is a lot of tech debt in the education space is now um, being paid off. So even before COVID, 50% of our learning time was already spent on online. However, in terms of the spent, only 5% of the uh, dollars were spent on this. So how do we explain this is like your Duolingo's of the world, your Coursera's of the world, your master classes of the world was already 50% of your time. And Colombia was the other 50%. However, people were only spending 5% on those things because people saw it as less and su supplemental to what you're doing in person. And now that is catching up. Before COVID, the um, experts mentioned that this tech that has to be caught up by 2025. And then that pace of catching up is um, you know, expedited. So I guess those are some of the things that we are obviously uh, 
very, very closely experiencing and seeing in the ed tech industry. And um, personally speaking, definitely people are way more receptive um, of the uh, online format of learning. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but if anyone else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or come off mute and ask. I'll start asking the questions that are in the chat or you can continue putting your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll ask them. Um, the first question is, did any of you work with SCORE or a small business development center? Any? I would say that's a no. <laughs> and the second question, oh, Camille, did you wanna say something? No, I mean, I, I guess I was going to say, you know, um, I found a lot of resources and support through my accelerator program. Um, and for me, I think, you know, that was incredibly helpful. Um, you know, now a few of us are at Columbia Startup Lab, um, you know, which also provides resources. It might not be exactly like, you know, the, a score or a small business development center. But I think that, you know, finding, you know, for, for an aspiring entrepreneur, finding um, you know, your community or somewhere where, um, you know, when you do have questions, whether it's a Facebook group, a Slack channel or what have you, um, where, you know, when you need an accounting software or when you need an IP attorney or when, you know, when you need whatever, um, you know, wherever that is for you, I think it's critical and it helps you stay sane. So, I mean, I would encourage anybody to find whatever that is for them and what would work. Yeah, I've definitely been through a few accelerators and one one of them, um, we, we interviewed for Techstars and made it to the final interview, but didn't get in. But because we made it to the final interview, they put us in a Techstars and Power Collective. And they and that community has been awesome. They teach you everything about being an entrepreneur from the ground up. And then if you need any resources or if you need a credit card or whatever it is for your business, they'll give you support on that. So highly recommend. Sorry, someone was going to say something. Yeah, and I was just going to say, um, so I, I know with, with me in terms of my business, like for example, consulting, it's not necessarily a business that is going to have as much traction in order to get gain capital, um, especially for myself being in the first year. So there are so many resources out there for um, grants and things like that. So I definitely um, follow Ask Alice. Um, that's something that definitely will um, share any grants or um, even, you know, uh, projects that, that you can apply to. Um, and Tory Birch Foundation for Female Founders as well um, is, is a great place to, um, to start. Um, for my business, I think, you know, I'm in year one. So even some of the things that if you're just starting out, you might not even know what is required on um, what, you know, in terms of legalities, in terms of accounting, things like that. And, um, and it's such a, a learning curve. So a lot of these resources will break them down step, step by step, step so that you can, um, you know, it's kind of like making your own business school to, to be honest, like totally. when you're at home, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, Techstars also has a lot of, uh, has a lot open and Y Combinator Startup School has a lot of resources that are open. So I look into that. I put in hello Alice in the in the comments and alpha.com. I find this also really helpful. If you have any questions, you just ask and people will answer you kind of like it's Reddit, but it's just for women in tech. And I think we only have time for the last question anyways. How do you locate potential angel investors or just investors in general if any of you to me and anyone else has, has uh, talked to any investors? Well, I can just say the hustle is real and it's just all about hustle. And, you know, when I just hear Jenna's story about, you know, going and, you know, finding a way to get in the security gate, no matter what it takes. I mean, it's kind of the same as in trying to find um, investors. I mean, there's no um, real way to or, or platform that just has them all for you. I think that um, it's uh, for me, uh, it was asking everybody I spoke to if they knew any of anybody who invested, you know, and that that usually led to one or two people making introductions and then speaking to them. And then it was a treasure hunt. You know, you just, you speak to lots of people. Um, and if they're not, um, you know, uh, if it's not the right fit with them, you ask them, well, do you have somebody who would be interested or who would be a better fit and ask for the introduction. Um, and then finally, I would also say, you know, uh, on uh, LinkedIn, um, a lot of people do put angel, um, angel investor in their profiles if they angel invest. You can always try um, reaching out to them or getting a warm introduction, which always helps. Also Crunchbase, um, whether it's for angel or um, other 
um, investors. Um, you look at businesses that would seem um, like a natural fit or something similar to what you're doing. You can see who's invested, um, make lists, so then you can see what companies they've invested in and who's invested in that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a rabbit hole, but you start somewhere and then you, know, you um, put the net out very, very large. And um, if you're looking to close a specific um, amount of money, I think, you know, just like uh, a lot of things is you always try to keep an active top of funnel, um, you know, and try to speak to as many people um, and get as many people top of funnel, even as you're bringing them down. Um, and then it's the grind. It's an absolute awesome. grind. Yeah, I think that's the thing, the thing with everything is sales is always an absolute grind, connecting with investors. I know we're coming up on the 4.30, 7.30, uh, Eastern time kind of stop point. So uh, I would love for you all to kind of just go through, give any final words of advice for anybody who's looking to start a business and also drop your LinkedIn or Twitter, or whatever you want in the comments so people can find you or tell people where they can find you. Um, Kimmy, since you're here already, <laughs> would, you like to, would you like to start? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, surround yourselves, uh, you know, with, you um, people who will help give you oxygen, um, you know, and help move you forward and that you can rely on to, uh, you know, share and discuss the good and the bad and the ugly with, you know, and who will help you find um, a way forward. And in terms of, you know, getting in touch with me, info at mouthoff.com. Amazing. Jenna, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a few things and tips I can share on the uh, angel investment, how to find angel investors as well. So you guys can just find me on LinkedIn. I just share my LinkedIn. We did 300K for pre-seed and we're almost closing our 1 million, um, mostly angels. So definitely can give you some um, insights there. Other than that- um, If you wanna yeah, give think... quick tips now, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can give you guys quick tips. So I think we did it a bit differently for, um, I guess I'm a, I was a, I'm a data scientist by my background. So some of the things that we did is, um, so first off, yeah, of course, hustle and then finding the right people. I think one thing that we did is um, you can think about the type of investors who would be interested in your business. So what that means is we segmented into a couple of different areas. So number one is for us at tech and the social impact, right? So you have that segment. And then second one, you can think about for us, it's minority founder, women-led businesses, right? So you can say education and then social enterprise and those three things. And then after that, what we've done is like, yes, there's a lot of these lists that's floating around, like what, um, you know, Michelle, you mentioned like the, you know, the tech stars has a list, you know, people have different types of lists. So when you get this type, type of list, what you want to do, you want, you want to segment people based on like their interests and their, where they fit in. And then, so that's one thing we, we did. Secondly is uh, we actually built our own web scraper. So um, web scraper in, meaning like we, we web scrape the LinkedIn and then based on our criteria, we can just scrape the people. You could have uh, keywords or different type of area. So really strategically kind of like approaching them into um, in this process. And another thing I would say also is like finding angel um, investors and also mentors that with angels, you set the terms, right? So you got to be sure about what you are doing. So uh, don't expect them to know, you know, so you got to have a very, very hard terms and one is finding, but then um, what you would notice is that you find them, you don't, you don't have the terms and things set up, you will lose them. So you have to be ready to be able to like give them the paper right away so they can sign um, right away. Anyways, any of those tips, definitely reach out to me. I can help you. Um, yeah, we've been doing this for a while. So yeah. Great. And Cindy. Yes, I just shared my LinkedIn and my website before I forget. So it's on the chat. Um, words of advice, I would say don't be afraid to get your feet wet in the industry. Um, I literally worked, you know, in retail, my dad said, if you want to join the family business, well, then you're going to have to learn it from the ground up. And so I worked at Bloomingdale's and I actually learned to sell product. <laughs> and um, when we started our business, um, I didn't know how to sell to retailers. So I just put myself in, in, in a trade show environment and I learned on the, on the spot, on the fly. So I feel like, you know, once you get your feet wet and dirty, it's, those are valuable skill sets that will carry you throughout, you know, different aspects of your life, whether it's in professional, whether it's, you know, at school, anywhere, it'll just, you know, bring you uh, far to places. And so 
those are words of advice and to surround yourself with people that are willing that are willing to help and willing to support you um, I think that's really important because you know as entrepreneurs we go through different stages we'll have good days bad days and you want to surround yourself with someone who will always push you forward and so um, I think that's really important great and finally Andrea <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so the words of advice that I would give, and um, so a lot of us have technical backgrounds, right? But that doesn't mean that you, if you do not have similar technical backgrounds, that doesn't mean that you can't be an entrepreneur. Um, I have been in the marketing ad space across all different industries for many years. And for me, when I started out, it's a mindset shift. You, If you're coming from corporate and you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to understand that maybe you are doing a lot of the work yourself, but you are your own boss, you are your CEO. And you have to remember that, especially when you are doing that to understand what your future goals are. Um, and so I say that because, you know, maybe the first few years will be rough or you might not have everything figured out. But if you can continue to ask questions, for me, um, I, I'm a solopreneur, but I have developed so many bonds with people from organizations like TAP, or I just did lunch clubs religiously twice a week for weeks so that I could build a network of people that I trust. And now I can have accountability buddies when I need them. So just find what works for you. Um, in terms of my course, I promised you guys um, my business, I promised you guys I'd let you know how I can help you. I just recently launched a beta course. Um, you know, this is our anniversary month. And this goes back to a lot of what Camille was saying is a lot of it is research and that involves your customer as well and trusting them to help you understand what is best for their needs. So my course is for um, anxious overachievers and I'll put the um, academy link in and essentially you'll get six weeks working with me um, on a weekly basis in a live group and um, workshops and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I genuinely, the last thing I'll say is, like I said, there are a lot of things that might not be um, easy to understand in the beginning and you wanna have everything figured out, but if you just take everything day by day and keep asking questions religiously, you're going to eventually have that click of what you need to do that's best for you and your business. Great, thank you so much, everyone. I think now I I'm just gonna pass it back off to the Columbia team if, if there's anything Hi, Lucia, you want to say to wrap up? No, I just want to thank everyone again so much for spending the hour with us. Hopefully, this has been really informative. Of course, any feedback for us as a team, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to us. And we want to wish you a really wonderful evening. And thank you again to all of the amazing panelists and to our moderator, Michelle. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>